Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, fans. Hello, viewers all over the world. Welcome to my platform, Timo Starboy Reality Talk TV. Yeah, you don't say to you don't say the protest for the inauguration on May 29, 2023. Yeah, this is another update. Another update. Yeah, so as with the CM, so with the given the given update. So you don't say it. the youth, they don't para. The youth, they say no, no way, no way, no way. So all this thing is not going to go down easily. So that is uh, the youth, they are shouting. And uh, moreover, the Buhari, it has for pardon. <laughs> it has for forgiveness. So as I the love, is the love. I know, say, this is very funny, you know. It's very funny. Uh, uh, topic is asking after they have caused genocide, they have caused uh, mayhem, they have caused chaos in the in the land, they have caused a lot of trouble, a lot of atrocity. So now he asking for forgiveness. For me, he can never see forgiveness to the rest of this life. It can never. It never happened. God will not forgive everybody that participated in destroying that land. You will never see any forgiveness. Because you know when you started all this your uh, all this your atrocity, all this your killing, you know, secret society, secret killing. And now you are asking for forgiveness. No, it will never happen. We will never forgive you, Buari. Because you, you know, and now that you are still insisting of putting somebody that they are not elected, putting somebody that you think you will continue your, 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 your deal, you know, your, your, your evil deal, and you never succumb. So now you will face the music. You face the music totally. You will face the music. So we never forgive you. And God will never do. Because you know what you are doing. You know what you are doing. So the nemesis will catch up with every one of you that participated in destroying that land. Because you never consider the youth that it is their country. You never consider their life. It's in danger, it's in care, it's in uh, chaos, in uh, trouble. You never do anything to be a good leader, to be a good example. So we we'll never, we we'll never forgive you. There is no how we can do so because you know, you know that you are doing very, very bad people to the youth. It is only about yourself. And your family and your and somebody all these people that they surrounded you all those people that benefit from the, the the bad atrocity you know so now I want to pay, play you a video a video of a youth that they are saying no that uh, Eagle Square will never happen the inauguration will never happen not in their own eyes so let's play the video and so you can hear very well. So let's go. Please don't forget share, share our program. It's very important. That's only what you're asking from you. We're not asking for your money. We're not asking for anything. Just share it and comment. Comment below. So let's go. Well, some of your colleagues, if not yourself, have been coming for in, um, an interim government. Yes. And it's seen as, that is seen as a move that is, you know, that amount to insurrection and treason. Yes, because there is a president elect, and um, in, uh, as it has been since the history of Nigeria's democracy, mm. once uh, a winner is declared, he is sworn in. So, why are there calls for an uh, interim government? Thank you very much for that question. It's a, it's a good thing you've given me the opportunity to clear the air on this as well. The moment we started calls for the interim government, the entire why this one, Jare? Don't come here. Don't come here. I don't need you. I don't need this. Uh... Oh, 
Oh, sorry, guys. Institutions, security agency, the, the baby minister for sorry, guys. Uh, interruption. Uh, labor and productivity, how to come on air and set all manner of things that he said. Why are we calling for interim government? It's very clear that by May 29, which is less than 48 days from today, there is going to be constitutionally, there's supposed to be a handing over to an incoming government. Mm. All that transpired during the last presidential election, the illegalities, it is unconstitutional. Yeah. So for you to swear in a man that had not met the entire geographical spread as it affects even the Abuja, the FCT, the only uh, principal uh, uh, cont uh, contender for that office that met that requirement, which is Mr. Peter Obi of the Labour Party, he is the only one that met the 25% and the 25% of the FCT that is enshrined in the constitution. Now, at that point, why are we calling for interim government? If the so called president elect of the APC and INEC happens to come into power by May 29. Even before he gets into power, he's this powerful. Within the corridors of power, a man that can throw a job on the president and get away with it. A man during the electionary period who said so many things that the president, he made the president, all manner of things he said, nothing was done to him. A man, if he could be that powerful at that level, is it when he now comes to power that we allow the litigation process to say true? Look at the characters with all due respect to his lordship, Chief Justice of the Federation. Um, Justice Kayode Ariola, you and I will attest to the fact that there were some uh, footages that were flying around some few weeks back. How he crashed into London in a wheelchair, in disgust, you know, he tried to disgust himself. No, isn't that part of the propaganda? Was now, there is no propaganda about it. Mm. It happened. I was the one who exposed that on the United office. I was the one. The video went viral. So how are every other uh, people called me from abroad and all of that? I substantiated the fact. He left this country on the on the seventh on, on, on the uh, on the seventh of uh, on the eleventh of uh, uh, to be precise. I think on the on the eleventh of uh, March. I think I, I, I can go back to that document and check the precise date he left. He left unannounced. The following week, the president alert had to leave the country as well. They brought, had to meet in the United Kingdom. Yeah, but there's no footage of them meeting. There is. Uh, is, is there, it was a successful arrangement. Well, he is a senior citizen. Uh, he's not unexpected for him to use uh, the age, uh, use the assistance of the wheelchair. Yes, yes. Mr. Mr. Presenter, mm -hmm. is your CGN currently, is he physically, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, is he physically impaired? Is he physically challenged? He uses as a individual. He uses a not a wheelchair. Stick. We know our chief justice of the federation. He works with food, by foot. And even when he was, uh, after he, he disembarked from the Atipo Heathrow Airport in the United Kingdom, when he dashed into his hotel room, he disembarked immediately from the wheelchair. We saw him gallivanting around the hotel room. So is there, is there, so now, are you saying that he was disguised? That is why we say that there was a clandestine meeting that was to happen in order to set justice to the highest bidder. And we have our records. We have another man, Justice Emeka Wente, a man who superintended over the Lawa case and the Apabio case. Everybody knows in this country that the entire gamut of the electoral uh, uh, the entire government of the electoral provisions were all flouted. And at the end of the day, these are individuals that never partook in the primaries of the election. They were, they, they were returned and they, give, they, they were given certificates of uh, uh, a clean head bill to contest the central uh, election. These are individuals that contested the primaries of the APC. And at the end of the day, they forcefully and twisted through the judicial process on the ground of technicality, passed judgment in their favor that they were the actual uh, uh, individuals that won. So, with all of these antecedents and all of this judgment, we don't have the confidence. But to some extent, we said, okay, this is a time for the judiciary to, in one way or the other, to redeem its image before the Nigerian people. It's between the Nigerian judiciary and the Nigerian people. So why are we calling for an interim government? Ordinarily, in organized crime, I'll give you an example in what happened in Kenya in 2017. In 2017, the presidential election took place in Kenya. But the people, that's just exactly what you have in Nigeria that took place in 25th, on the 25th of February 2023 in this country. That was exactly what happened in Kenya in 2017. What happened? At the end of the day, Raila Odinga, it was versus Raila Odinga versus uh, Uhuru Kiyata. Raila Odinga had to go to court. And the Supreme Court, before this swearing in, the Supreme Court, in 21 days in Kenya in 2017, you can fact check me on that, mm -hmm. in 2017, the, the Raila Odinga had to go to court. And the Supreme Court passed judgment in two weeks on the litigation. What was their judgment? They found out that the irregularities, illegalities that transpired during the trial Transmission of results in Kenya were all shooted in in all manner of shenanigans. Mm -hmm. They were all a lot of irregularities. And at the end of the day, what happened? They nullified that election. That was an election that ordinarily the, 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 the chief independent uh, electoral and boundary commission 
that is IEBC of Kenya. The man is by name uh, Wafula Chibukati. As Agata um, announced the incumbent president, Uburu Kayata, on a 54% win. He already announced it and claimed president elect of Kenya. And that is why the rally on the had to go to court and challenge that. And the Supreme Court, we are very swift in adjudicating justice because they know how sensitive and important that particular case was. And at the end of the day, the, the, the city president had to take it in good faith. And the, result, and the Supreme Court ordered the electoral body of Kenya to conduct a fresh election within 60 days. And that was when the entire people had to troop to the streets and they started celebrating. So if Kenya could have done that, the powerhouse of the East African nation. Why will Nigeria not be able to do that? Hmm. They are trying to buy time so that the so-called president-elect will come into power. And by the time he, he is sworn in as president of Nigeria, then he will be able to tamper with the judicial process. Hmm. We all know how Amechi addressed the press conference during the election in, in River State. He said the current CGN of the country, his lordship, was a surrogate appointor of the Tinibu camp. Who was he talking about? Hmm. It was a recommendation from the Tinibu camp. And we know who appointed him. Who nominated him. For the appointment. So these are the characters that want to superintend over the presidential litigation. And we are saying no, they should recourse themselves. It's a legal terminology. They have been the one using the term recourse. So it's hard time they too should recourse themselves from presiding over this litigation. Nigerians don't have the confidence yeah. in them superintending over the presidential litigation. And we are appealing. I want to use this opportunity to also appeal to mm. the judiciary from the appellate court where the Chaguna case will begin to the Supreme Court that they should allow cameras into their courtroom. Mm. Kenya did it, South Africa did it, so that Nigerians will have access to justice in any part of the world. Those in the diaspora, those within the shores of this country should have access to justice. I think that will go a long way to infuse a kind of deterrent, a kind of fear, a still trepidation in any of these justices that would be missing the, pot the potentials to, uh, uh, to travesty of justice or to, the, to, 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 to issue a miscarriage of justice and serve justice to the highest bidder mm. of, the, of, of the APC. That's true. So that is why we, we have continually called for the Italian government. There will be no cause for Italian government if they can be swift enough when said Abakuba let's say so within seven days this litigation can be concluded exactly. before it gets to the Supreme Court what is holding them up till this moment as I speak to you they have not started the entertaining most <laughs> of these the, the petitions we don't have time on our side that tells you these people are buying time they know what so they are doing that they are illegally declared on Nigerian people read them all over and we will not we will do everything within the law we will do everything within the law as civil society organizations we will mobilize Nigerians in their hundreds of thousands on that very day to get to Eagle Square except they, want, they have the opportunity or they make up their mind to swear in their, their own president elect probably inside the, in, in a restaurant but not at Eagle Square Nigerians will talk about the Eagle Square peacefully mm -hmm. nobody is preaching insurrection nobody is preaching violence the way they have labeled us but we are on the path of justice but we are not be obstructing um, something constitutional uh, the issue is has I like declared the winner isn't that what, all that is necessary for it to be constitutional in the moment? And there are many people say that uh, it has happened even in Nigeria. We're sitting, not a president, um, obviously, but we say state governors, even um, the person in question here, the Labour Party presidential candidate, that is how he came into power mm -hmm. in a number of states. He lost an election, he went to court, I think he, if I recall, it took almost a year or three years. Three years, so pardon me. And then he got uh, back in office. He had to fight the incumbent who. Uh, quote unquote defeated him and yet he got it. And people will say, uh, if these things have happened, it happened with um, uh, Peter Albee, it happened with uh, from, former Edo State Governor Adam Toshomule, uh, it has happened, I think, in um, one other case or so. So people say, if this has happened, you know, why is what is the big deal this time around? Lack of an interim government. Is an interim government constitutional in the first place? Uh, why not just do as it has, has been done before? Go to the courts, whatever time it takes. Uh, like they say, the judgment is retrospective or is it retroactive. So once it's, it's, it's called, uh, if Peter B is, is the true winner, he would come in and take over and, you know. This is different. This is a presidential. So, you know, what do you make of that? It's a presidential race. We are Nigerians that are, you know, aware of yesterday, today. And, and they are dealing with the devil. As Nigerians, I speak authoritatively with a historiographic memory of all that has happened in this country in the last 23 years. And I can put it to you that the 2023 general election is a clear departure in mm -hmm. terms of in being in contrast with other electoral processes that has happened since the advent of the Fourth Republic from 1999 to date. What I'm trying to tell you here is this. We will not allow it will be an illegality. Mm -hmm. It is even a more treasonable offense for INEC to have ambushed Nigerians, mm -hmm. Nicodemus, at about 4 a.m. to announce an illegality. I 
as the president elect to this mm -hmm. country. At that point, a lawyer who did not meet the threshold of the entire process to be declared president, you went ahead when you have serious advantages, litany of issues, if the party agents waste. You were so much in a hurry, and the electoral act gives the INEC boss several days to address that issue before going ahead to declare the president elect. But he didn't observe the process. They That's the law. They abrogated the entire And they broke the law. And these are areas that are, you know, before the Nigerian people, before the Nigerian public, for discourse. And that is one of the reasons. When you say the on one ground, we are calling, on one ground are we calling for the interim government? Mm. And we keep reiterating if it is constitutional or non constitutional. Now, let me take you to that section of the constitution to start with. We, before a, an interim government can be declared mm. in Nigeria, it is when you have a chaotic mm. atmosphere in the country and when the territorial integrity of Nigeria is being threatened either in riots mm. or in chaos. And at that point, it is expected that the sitting National Assembly of within that period of time will now be able to draft a letter to Mr. President for his consent, mm. for seeking for his extension of tenure by six months so that he can be able to clear the crisis before handing over to uh, the incoming administration. On that mm. ground, the Constitution permits an interim government only when the serving state is being threatened. Mm. But in this premise, it's quite a different scenario. Because it's a rigging. INEC itself, under the leadership, I repeat, under the leadership mm. of Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, who has destroyed the entirety of integrity left yeah. in that institution. And they are and not abiding by the law. They broke the law. A president that so they should cancel everything. Voted for in his generality by Nigerian. We know the law, man. We have the results of those elections. We know the law. We know what we are doing. Most of those centers to observe the elections. And each of these parties challenging the outcome of the general presidential general election, they find their cases in court. You can see what the frivolous charges the APC uh, had come up with uh, in recent time. And you can see what INEC have done. After the 308 billion era that mm. was splashed on the conduct of the 2023 general election. And at the end of the day, look at the kind of election that was given <laughs> to Nigerians by INEC. We've asked Syria and other organizations. A very jo joking one. On the very dramatic one. Commission to, as a matter of urgency, scrutinize mm. how does the expenditure of the entire process went. We have to give a breakdown on how they spent 308 billion dollar taxpayers' money. Mm. And as I speak to you, the nine-man SAM team that INEC had put forward under the leadership of the NBA president that will be defending the illegality that INEC illegality. is embedded in. Hmm. The INEC have set aside three billion era to defend illegality. Hmm. That is another taxpayer's money in a profitable yeah, exactly. Our because taxpayer's money. Oh. That billion era has been expended. Our money has been set aside, has been earmarked to Just defend waste it like that. That will be thrown on those three sands to defend what INEC, the irregularities INEC have foisted on hmm. the Nigerian people. And these are things that we are saying no to. So, you could hear one of the vice presidential candidates of the uh, uh, Labour, the, the, of, of the 23 general election. And now the, the Muham, uh, uh, President Muhammadu is, is begging for pardon. It is, it will remain unconstitutional. He's begging for forgiveness an after all this set and done. Swear in a government that has no merits. There is no how you would meet. Expected. Our As forgiveness. It the constitutional arrangement for you to be de declared president elect in the first place. So you are about ending democracy. And you the have met your water and low. They started calling for his head. They said all manner of things. You raised the issue of Ch uh, Chimamanda not quite long. A, a global icon that has over 40 honorary degrees all over the world. Hmm. When she was defending the interests of Nigerians, talking about artifacts to be returned to, to Benin and all of that, in the, within the international scene, she was seen as a goddess. Hmm. She was seen as an angel. But because she had decided to turn the path of truth, to lend her voice among those Nigerians that are calling for the, the restoration of the stolen presidential mandate that has been, that has been uh, 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 this is it, on the Nigerian people. She wrote to the President of the United States of America, citing her stand, taking her position. What crime has she committed? 
No PC at her doors have loaded her manner of names that mm -hmm. she didn't vote. She doesn't have the right to criticize the process mm -hmm. that she didn't. And she came on air two days ago or a day ago in one of the sister stations as well to also clear the air why she, did, she couldn't vote because they deliberately disenfranchised Nigerians. Yeah. The, 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 the methodology upon which they were supposed to dispense the voters' card to Nigerians, they deliberately frustrated, sabotaged that effort. Yeah, that orchestrating the, the whole plan by themselves. Her voters' card to be part of the process. But as a Nigerian, Despite the fact that she she is based in the diaspora, she said her house, she owns a house in Lagos and she has a house in the US. So she is a Nigerian, she is free to comment on what happens in the country. You and I, you understand me? So when we, in a nutshell, back to your question, it is not all constitutional. It is our right to demand for fairness, yes. justice, and equity. Because yes. the Nigerian people, even the international community, are not satisfied mm. with the outcome of the presidential election. And on that premise, we anchor our voice. We are the vanguard of that struggle, calling for the an interim government. Mm. That is the only way Nigerians will be satisfied. That is the only way Nigerians will be satisfied that the litigation, the presidential litigation, yeah. will be sent smoothly. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, um, so, people, everyone, so, you're watching news. So, my people, um, that is it. Uh, that is it for the video. You know, the people, they are right to call for the interior government, you know, just for the whole chaos, for the whole problem to die down. Because at as now, at as this point now, they can never swore in the made, uh, made up a president. You can never put anybody that the whole entire country doesn't like, they doesn't believe. You cannot do uh, impunity on us, you know, the way you are doing before. So this time around, it is not business as usual. We now allow it. We youth, we have rise up, we have said no. A no to nonsense. A no to... Uh, illegality way you are doing you know you want everything to be legal this is illegal so illegal cannot stay so you cannot dictate for us you cannot dictate for us if you want our pardon if you want our forgiveness you need to do something that is right for the people so let me play you another video guys let me play you another video this one is another one uh, a non-government they have started their own <laughs> action so this is uh in emo that is the uh, west uh, east side you know east east side they are doing they are doing their own action so we don't know where it will escalate to maybe it might come to south south or not so it will start from there until may 29 that they want to do their this uh, fake inauguration, the action will start from now. Action movement, protest all over the places. So that is how it's gonna be. Let me play you this one. Everyone, you're watching News Night. Yeah. Where five policemen have been killed in an attack by gunmen. Five in policemen. Evil State. A Are you here? Five policemen that's been killed. Sorry, sorry, guys. Occurred when a team on patrol of the area was yeah. attacked. The state's police command has been drafted to the area to arrest. Five policemen have been killed so far. In a series of attacks in the state, and in it, recent it months, can be going on. A few we don't days know. ago, an inspector of police, um, Augustine Ukebu, was killed by yeah. gunmen. That's Last right here. Month, Three officers of the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps were killed uh, following an ambush in the Obiangu community. They are killed. You can see. This is the news. We're joined now by a former commissioner of police for the FCT, Lawrence Aloui. Good to see you. And thanks for your time. Not so, so, the so killing now is as coming up, yeah. you know. We uh, don't know when it's going to stop uh, until the, the right thing has been done. That's uh, mm -hmm. very sad. And... Uh, to speak to us about first uh, Please, excuse me, guys. safety because for those keeping watch over us first they also must be safe to do the job yeah thank you very much friend let me come through with the families of these uh, victims of English by nigerians those who are there to protect us and protect and guide you maternal order for you 
I'm sure the government and everything about this the state is well in order. We tell you an order to ensure public peace and security and not being murdered by the people. That's an act of ingratitude in the, in the part of Nigerians. You see, like Christ, those who came to say with those who, who, who crucified him, those the police are trying to protect the one who are now attacking the police. Section 24, yeah, the country provides that this, the, the citizens have a constitutional duty to, 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 to assist religious maintenance of law and order. Then that, does this show that people of Imo State are prepared to assist the police in, in, in ensuring that law and order is maintained in the state? Put on patrol, patrol, to, patrol to ensure security and, and order, prevent crime, protect law and order. Because of doing it, they are now being murdered. It's unfortunate. We're not, too sure, we're, we're not too sure this is coming uh, from the citizens of Igbo state. So no, no, no. But it's, it's anybody who, and it's those who in that 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 that's, that's state, that space, that environment. It is Igbo state. It's, it has a location. Those who reside, they don't like it. Not angels from the moon. Not not spirit. Those who were there, they did it. See, it's very embarrassing to the country. Right. So what could the people have done? I mean, if the police and other security agencies. Uh, can't protect themselves. I mean, who are we ordinary uh, civilians, you know, to uh, be guaranteed any sense of security or protection? What exactly yeah, are sorry, we guys. doing right at the government level? And how can this, uh, you know, be fixed? Yeah, the problem is, is it lies both the police itself, the police leadership itself, and the policemen themselves. Hmm. You see, when I was a police constable, when I was the mobile, we were taught, sleep, sleep like a snake and sleep like a cat. Hmm. That's alertness and vigilance at all times. But I mean, even if you're on patrol, you need to think about your own safety. You have to be at alert. You suspect right. everything around you. At all times. At all yeah. times. You say, sniff like a, it's like a cat. Mm. A cow sniffs. You see it pointing its nose to sniff. It is safe to, 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 to try to go through this place. And it snakes. Every, every sound it snakes wakes up. It's alertness and vigilance. But it's no longer there. Let and that's because of lack of training. Yeah. Lack of training on the part uh -huh. of the police. The police have not actually been backing on training the men. And when you're not trained, you don't have capacity to even to respond to situations when the police when they occur. You don't even have the courage. You look, you are so complacent, you don't even show. You don't, every policeman in Imo City, Imo City, like, like a danger zone, mm. should be conscious of the environment. And be very black at that all times. But it's they, they just so, if you see them on roadblock, they are so complacent. Some of them are just continue to concern about it. They don't even know what they are doing there. They're concerned how to probably to get, uh, get, get, get money. Let me say, let me, let me be blunt, to get money from people. That's not, that's not what they are there. Mm. So these things are so they are so pure with with what to get, what do I get, not what to do and and, and do it and, and do it rightly. So the government too has failed. The police is the least, the least, the least, the least. They are the one who caused it in the first place. There is no security. I served in the police for 35 years, mm -hmm. and I know what we went through. The policeman is, is neglected even while in service, and after his service, he's been neglected every time. It's an unfortunate situation, mm -hmm. and it's embarrassing this country. It's the police that the people can assert the, 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 the government of the country. Exactly. You see the, the friend of the police, how the police, how you see happy, you see motivated, you see it permits the, the, the government, the government government having the country. So the government too has failed. They have failed the police. When they were in service, it was never like this. As a, as a police, I was a DPU. I had a staff car. I said, I come had a staff car. But the same commission police don't have staff cars. You see, to know how bad it is. As in those days, every police vehicle goes to a fuel drop and get fuel. Mm -hmm. And you'll be given, just give, 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 the, give the, the, the bill, the, 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 the way bill. But now, you have to go and queue public <laughs> police to buy fuel. You mm -hmm. don't have the fuel. So, so, how is, how bad is that? so the government yeah. itself has contributed a contribu contributing factor to the the, 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 what the, nasty the, the, the decadence where the, 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 the mess the police is going through. The police has gone down the drain. Yes. So I have to say it without a convocation. They have gone down the drain. And also leadership also determines followership. That's what the police should also seed up. They should be they should feel concerned. They will face the music. They are being killed. This time. No, no service from the police now. Why? The government, the federal government, no minister made. In Germany, mm. when a police constable was killed, the, the president of that country was there, the barrier. But mm. nobody said anything about the police man being, the police man being killed. Mm. Even during the war, police were never killed, and they're being killed so, now. Sipialo, let's go back to the uh, training you spoke about. Uh, yes. Perhaps maybe the curriculum. Do you think it's something that should be reaching? I'll say this because uh, when you travel around across Nigeria, you see soldiers who mount roadblocks. They don't converge together. You see one and maybe another 
hundred meters distance. of distance. So you will never see them cluster, mm. cluster yeah. to the extent that we always see this clustering of police officers. So it makes it so easy for the bad guys to take all of them out. So uh, is it the training that they get that they must all cluster? Mm. Yeah, but that training will emphasize. You know, when in an, op in an operation, you, make, you don't make yourself so vulnerable to people, to, 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 to the whole blooms. Mm. You have to progress strategically. So, you know, to be able to respond properly to, to situations. So, but when they go, they are concerned about what do I get from this roadblock duty. They're mm. concerned about, uh, they are not even concerned about their own safety. They're so exactly. concerned what they will get. So, that is the thing. So, I think the training has done a lot. Lack of training has done a lot to the German police force effectively, operationally, and in terms of even public, public perception. It's very, very bad. So the police, the government should vote more on training. And the police officer, the police leadership should emphasize about training. When you train, you build capacity. When you build capacity, you enhance the effective, the personal capacity, the effective of the, of the officer and the individual. So training is very, very important. Very well said. Now, let's look at what the possible motive could be. Because when you look at the details that we have so far about the circumstances that led to the killing of the seven uh, police officers, we're told that they were actually um, in a restaurant meeting. And, you know, these bandits came out from nowhere and shot and killed them and took away their rifles. Several police officers have gone Alan down, as we are about. talking I mean, now. Apparently, there is so ridiculous. a gang or a group of persons who want to have access to, to arms. Is that what it's about? No, no, it's the criminals. And it's what, not only in Nemo State that they're killing police what officers. They, what the criminals look after when they kill the police is the arm. Hmm. They will not be interested in a person's life, but how to get the arm. Hmm. And the only can get the arm is to kill the person. So... And again, if they are out in Italy, if they are actually trained police officers, they will know that you will, all of you will not just sit down together. Because as, as we monitor the criminals, the criminals also monitor the police and also the agencies. They monitor to see how, how you well fortified, are you well prepared, are you vigilant, are you, are you so lax and complacent that they, are you can use it. Let me tell you a story. When Oyenusi, so not Oyenusi, uh, the case that happened in, in Lagos, I think you didn't see yes. Mm. They went to the first bank. They made the policeman, a mobile man was right a lot. Ah, because you know, a little, because you know, and a little bell. That is the man that the man, <laughs> man was sitting at a lot. Mm. They went to the next bank. The man was just sitting one side, the other one side. They, they just blew him off and carried out the rifle. So you need, their the, the likeness even sends, it sends, it sends signal to the criminal. If they know you, they, because they watch you, they, they, they monitor you and see how alert you, how vigilant and alert you are, how prepared are you in case, in case there's an incident. So I think training, training has done, has, has, the lack of training has done a lot to the, the police force. And the citizens themselves don't appreciate the police. It is sad. Even police, they, they are corrupt. Why they to save you, to protect you, tell you another. Their and corruption become, is so high. They are how they are just collecting of, 50, you know, 50 naira. I'm happy he's uh, from uh, more uh, of you bringing this, uh, because I recall, uh, it got to a point, the military they will not be get more. Uh, what they call the civil military relations. Uh, do you think that is lacking in the police? Because till date, Nigerians, uh, some Nigerians still think that the police uh, isn't uh, a yeah. friend. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. See, they are incompetent. In particular, the army. Yes. They are more concerned about public relations. But the police public relations are only concerned about parading suspects. Mm. I was uh -oh. a peer in Golden Ambra State. Because of my husband being a peer, I was a DSP. Mrs. O'Kara was the director of the ATA. Because of my program, police in the public every Thursday in Enugu, all the number. Policemen will no longer pay transport in Enugu State, in Enugu, mm. public transport in Enugu. You see, you, win, you need to win the hearts of the people, the mm. hearts and minds of the people. You need to endear to the people. Yeah. You know, and the only idea of the people, when you, when you police with, with empathy, you police with, 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 with the fear of God. Mm. You know, we feel that, at, when I was sick, I told my, told my men, as you want your yeah, uh, brothers and sisters to be policed in your villages, police in your villages, that's how you police me in Abuja, where I'm a commissioner of police. Then to the contrary, I, you, have, you, have, you have my wrath. So the leadership to supervision to is lacking in the police. <laughs> Because if the men are posted, leave them on their, on their own, they know they're not being supervised, they do what they like. Mm. But if they are being supervised and visited by officers, give them the rules of engagement, operational stand, operational, uh, operational uh, standard, you know, they, and rules of engagement, code of conduct, and they make their things. When I was in service, I make lecture training very, very important. Even I was recommended in Inugu, I personally recommend Inugu. All of us are men within my area command. I carry out training, with the training for all of them. And I mm. wonder who's going to provide this training, I mean, uh, yeah. to the uh, officers. Now, let's 
look no, at let me the answer fact. That. Yes, yes. <laughs> you see, it is not the commissioner of police. It's not the IG. The officer on ground. You need to train your men. You want to use, you utilize them. You want to use them. The more you train the men, the more they're effective in doing their job, and the more the better you have, it better for you. But we don't train them. What you call vicarious liability? Yeah. When the men go outside and misbehave, you have vicarious liability because for their in for their, for, their, for, for, for their ineffectiveness. Exactly. How troubling is it that? Every time we hear about the killing of policemen, we just hear unknown gunmen, and it remains that way. No arrests made. What exactly is the challenge? It is because we don't have empathy. Yes. Our government don't have empathy. Our leaders don't have empathy. These policemen who have just been murdered, I'm sure their family the next day ask them to leave the barracks. Hmm. <laughs> the next day, no empathy, no compassion. Hmm. And they, it's so sad. Hmm. It's so sad. You see, we learn to have compassion, empathy. That's why you see the. That's why we show the God in us. That empathy, that concern about others, even about others. So I think we need, we need, we need, we need this country. We need to, to reinvent our, 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 ourselves, to rethink about what are we doing. The, the security police, police in particular. The police in particular is are the nearest institution to the, the, the military, the security institution to the, to the public. Mm. Because they want to police law and order, mental order for the people. And if they now begin, they now become begin to be the targets of, of attack, mm -hmm. they might end up. They, 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 they don't have the, they don't have the, the courage to come come on board again. Mm -hmm. They be afraid to even do that. They, they lose confidence. Maybe the question that has not been answered is why are the police the target? The police are the target why are they because targeted? you see, it, they, they probably vent their anger against the government on the police. Mm -hmm. and, as I said earlier, the police are the closest people. They see this. And they see the government as the, on the police. Because they see as the police, the police as agent, agent, agency of government that is it to maintain law and order for the government. Because they see, you know, sometimes it is the, 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 the mentality of uh, regime protection, hmm. not about the people themselves. And the people that they are there because of the, the government. But the people now, don't, they now vent their anger, their animosity, their grievances they have for the government. All these are the police. You are not the, the target. And now nobody cares. Everybody, nobody cares. Nobody bothers. If a policeman has shot one civilian now, oh, police brutality. Hmm. But now nobody talk about civilian brutality on the police. Oh, well, oh. That's why we're talking about it. Well, I'm happy. Arise yeah. doing it, but other, other agencies, other media are keep quiet. But even there's any things that against the police. Oh, we had headline: police, police this, police that. But now police is now the target of murder, and attack. No, I'm, as apart from arise, I'm not seeing anybody making that. Making that. We should create that awareness. The media is there to yeah. let the, the people, citizens, understand that they have responsibility to, to assist great gentlemen in terms of law and order. You know, it is, it is inhuman. It's criminal. It's sinful. It's barbaric to kill a policeman or yeah. a yeah. member of the yeah, to, to, to think that is a very serious crime in other climes. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Lawrence Alubi, the former commissioner of police. You see, um, my people, this is not a case of uh, Barnabas and uh, Jesus Christ. You get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. What I mean by that is... It's not going to be a Barabbas and Jesus Christ that you say crucify somebody that not, it doesn't sin. This is, if you are a sinner, you will be crucified for your own action. So, this case, all these police, they are killing, they are the one that cause it. Because if they have done their job very properly, if they have secured their area, there won't be any... Uh, gun, gunmen shot or gunmen killing police, you know, because they too, they are corrupt. They are corrupt. Most of them, they will be chasing the goose. They will be chasing somebody that they supposed not to chase. They will be collecting all this fifty-fifty naira alongside of the road instead of that to do their job very well. So they are the one to blame for it because they are the security. And they will allow all these uh, uh, these sinners, all these arm robber, to let loose. Instead of them to chase, to chase all these criminal, hard criminal, they will be chasing people that they are fighting for their life, they are fighting for their right. So I don't blame all these uh, gunmen shooting them because they have been robbing them, their own... Uh, their, their, their own freedom uh, will, you know. They kept them in the darkness. They kept them in the darkness. 
and they are robbing them on their will. So they should. Sorry. This is another one. Let me just give you the taste. You see, all this problem, they cause it by themselves. They are the one who cause it because people are living in denial. They are living in denial. So, it is the case. It is the case of crucify Barnabas. The case of crucifying Barnabas. That is what I see into this case. The sinner cannot go free. He cannot go score free. Like this, your president is begging for is begging for uh, forgiveness. He can never see forgiveness because he doesn't deserve one. So let me give you another one. Another. I think I saw one thing here that. The boy was saying that if they don't give him, if they are giving him a problem, he will run to Niger, where he belong, where his family belong. You know, I saw it somewhere. Unless maybe they took it off. I saw this thing now. If I didn't see it again, so... Okay, let's watch this one. Uh, Oshiba Jo statement. Of an encounter that I had many years ago. Let's play this one to you. Oshiba Jo statement. I was about to get married and I was searching for a good place to rent, a good house to rent. This is your uh, vice president. Landlord to be. Let's hear what you got to say. To be an elderly lawyer who obviously did more real estate than legal practice. I mean, he was mm. mainly just a uh, business of real estate. So when I met him, he let me know that there were three categories of people that he would not rent his property to. Mm. Of course, he didn't know who I was. And the three categories of people that he would not rent his properties to were Igbos, Ijebus, and lawyers. Mm. Igbos, Ijebus, and lawyers. He made it very clear to me. I was disqualified on two accounts. He then said to me, he then said to me, pointing behind him, at a few shriveled looking books in a small bookshelf behind him. The man was like just talking, happened. the man was talking about ethnic, ethnic uh, profiling, you know, how they, uh, they got treated, how he was got treated when he wanted to rent house. So anyway, just listen to the content of uh, his speech, you know. Arsenal to destroy any tenant in court if I give him any trouble. He later on, of course, discovered to his embarrassment that I was a law teacher and at the time advisor to the then Attorney General of the Federation. And of course, that I'm also Ijebu. Hmm. I've shared this story to illustrate a point that I think is hugely important, which is that prejudice and bias are natural aspects of human nature. Everyone has prejudices and preferences that are reinforced by stories and narratives that they hear. Prejudice is a function of environment in which one is socialized and the level of exposure that one has. All across this country, different ethnicities are subjects of popular stereotypes, whether it is the notion that Ijebus are stingy or that Igbos have an excessive love for money or that the Fulanis are cunning unforgiving, or more recently, violent, or that the Ibira and the Ika are practitioners of seasoned witchcraft. 
these are stereotypes. And they're, of course, by the very nature of stereotypes, wild generalizations, most likely to be false, and unlikely to hold up to any kind of empirical test. But they are the narratives people have woven about other tribes and, in fact, people of other religions. Sometimes these stories are repeated so many times that they are soon accepted as facts. And when we accept these stories as facts about other people, and people of other ethnicities and people of other religions, who we have never met with or interacted with, they shape our judgments about them even before they have spoken. Elections, for example, by their very nature, tend to be already divisive. Partisan democratic competition compels us to align ourselves with the camps that most reflect our ideals and aspirations. In a diverse society such as ours, democratic competition is intensified by the social cultural cleavages that exist in society. This is true of any heterogeneous society or democracy. In an election cycle in which the major contenders come from different ethno-regional classes or zones, there was always a sense that the competition was going to be particularly intense. But at the same time, it would not be accurate to reduce the election to an ethnic census. As we saw, the contenders performed strongly in parts of the country other than their natal regions. Unfortunately, one of the unsavory tendencies that was witnessed in this election cycle, and has been so in previous ones, but perhaps heightened somewhat, was the weaponization of ethnic, religious, and sectional prejudices in ways that are damaging to social cohesion. Religion was quite clearly made an issue. And in some parts of the country, political biases are introduced even between denominations of the same religion. Mm. In some cases, ethnic profiling took place at polling booths. Ethnic profiling. There's a popular female food blogger and YouTuber, a YouTuber called Sisi Yemi, a Yoruba woman, who took to her verified Twitter handle to say, and I quote, my husband and I were not allowed to vote. They said we look like Igbo people. I can't believe this, end of quote. Almost without fail, in every election cycle, politicians have forcefully, either overtly or covertly, sought to persuade voters that voting for their particular candidate or the particular political party they favor is the will of God, and that voting for the opposing party was a violation of the divine will. Repeatedly, we hear of prophets who support political parties, one way or the other. This is a matter of great concern, because long after an election is over, and long after the leading contenders have sheathed their thoughts, the rhetoric, the words, and the means used to compete can have adverse long-term effects on society. Where the forces of primordial division and polarization are harnessed for the sake of electoral gain, the venom of such devices remain and continue to poison communal relations, setting neighbors against neighbors. Some of the political rhetoric that we have heard in the course of this election cycle have been disturbing because they recall similar rhetoric used by politicians during some of the darkest chapters of our country's existence. In the First Republic, the exploitation of prejudice and incitement of hatred against ethnic communities led to the collapse of that democratic dispensation, it led to bloody pogroms, and a civil war that cost in excess of two million lives. Hmm. We talk about the civil war, yeah. but we seem to ignore the fact yeah. that it was Sorry, the guys. manipulation of ethno-religious sentiment that eventually boiled over into mm -hmm. that tragedy. The demons released by that bloody conflict amongst brothers mm -hmm. are yet to be fully caged, and we pay the price of that healing process every day. That was a good point. That is not a chapter of our history that we should ever allow to repeat itself. But believe it or not, That's Nigeria is changing. 
there are no longer any ethnically homogeneous enclaves in Nigeria. As it's, our own nation has evolved, one of the most discernible changes that we have witnessed is the disappearance of ethnically homogeneous spaces. Everywhere across the country, people from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds are schooling together, doing business together, co-mingling, intermarrying, and raising families. Mm. Our much talked about linguistic diversity is not a barrier as many Nigerians are multilingual. It's not a do or die. We see that the heart and face of a new Nigeria is a social-cultural hybrid, hmm. appreciative of the cultural diversity of our society, attuned to its culture, but also blessed with an inclusive cosmopolitan outlook. For many of these Nigerians, young Nigerians in particular, yes. their ethnic and national identities are not in contradiction. For young Nigerians who belong to the most globalized generation in, their, in, in, in our country's history, this is especially true. Their friendships, their education, their lived experiences have brought them into contact with a favorable variety of identities and cultures in their societies and on the planet. Mm. And we see their multicultural outlook in the social networks, in the entrepreneurial partnerships, and their political activism which transcends the old primordial allegiances. Leadership does not today, and Nigerian leadership today, does not have the luxury of toying with prejudice. The leadership elite, and when I refer to the leadership elite, I refer not just to the political elite, I refer also to the religious elite and to the business elite. We have a duty to conduct ourselves with a high sense of responsibility, even as we prosecute the contest for power. Historically, conscious and patriotic elite all over the world recognize that beyond the letter of the law, beyond what the law asserts, there are lines that must not be crossed yes. in the pursuit of political power, especially in fragile societies and democracies such as ours. Mm. One of such lines is the willful exploitation of sectional sentiments and the invocation of ethnic antipathies mm. to mobilize a political constituency. This is the challenge of leadership in our own country today. And it's a challenge that our leadership elite face. Elites have a responsibility to, to discipline themselves first yes. and foremost yes. in the pursuit of political ambitions yes. and their exercise of power to ensure that the fabric of our communities is not rent asunder. We must recognize that if peaceful coexistence is sacrificed on the altar of partisan politics, then all will be lost. Hmm. I believe that Nigeria is neither unique nor exceptional on account of her diversity. The genre of scholarship and public polemic that makes a problem of our country's profusion of ethnicities and religions and characterizes it as a profound flaw is one that I differ strongly with. I very strongly differ that merely because we are ethnic nations that came together or that we are from different religions, for that reason it is necessarily a huge problem that is insurmountable. My diversity is neither a liability nor a curse. It is in fact a blessing and an asset. Diversity deepens the pool of sociocultural capital available to us. We are enriched by the frothy ferment of the vast multiplicity of perspectives which provide us with a treasury of tools for growth and progress. And I have long maintained that in Nigeria what is at issue is not and has never been our diversity, but our capacity to manage it with a sense of fairness, equity and justice. All diverse nations find their unique ways of managing the tensions which inevitably arise from the co-mingling of an assortment of people. Let me conclude with another personal story. On the 16th of July 2022, I went in for a surgery on my right femur at a hospital in Lagos. As I lay on the operating bed hmm. and I was about to be anesthetized, full anesthesia which will put me out completely, I'm now be completely unconscious for the three hours or so that the operation would take. Just before I lost consciousness, a thought crossed my mind that I would be absolutely at the mercy of these surgeons and paramedics 
an anesthetist who surrounded the bed that I was lying on. It struck me that I had actually allowed these people to take over my life hmm. and I had to entrust them with my life. One of them was from the southeast, the head of the team was from Delta, hmm. some were Muslims, some were Christians, some were from the north, some were from the south. In fact, I suspect that one of them, who I spoke to later, did not even believe in God. <laughs> yet, yet, as I lay on that bed, it didn't seem to matter where they came from, because they were experts. When we make the decisions that affect our lives and the decisions that affect our children the most, somehow we're able to ignore tribal or religious prejudices. The pilots who flew our planes or who fly our planes, hmm. in fact, the pilots about a couple of weeks ago, I was flown to Lagos by two female pilots. So for those amongst my team who discriminate against women, they were left entirely in the hands of these two ladies who flew us all the way to Lagos. The mm. teachers who teach our children in school, we don't necessarily ask where they are from so long as they are good teachers. The soldiers and other law enforcement agents who put their lives on the line for our safety every day, we don't ask them where they are from so long as they can do a good job. Even the members of our national football team, we don't care if all of them are called Oshibaju, so long as they can score. We don't care where they're from, and we don't ask those questions. This is the attitude that we must adopt always to build the nation of our dreams. Mobilizing the people of a country as complex and as heterogeneous as ours, under the banner of a common purpose, was never going to be an easy task. But that's not to say that it's impossible. Let us never forget that although we may speak different languages and belong to different tribes and profess diverse creeds, we are bound by a shared language and a shared hope by a common humanity as Nigerians and a supreme faith in all of the possibilities that lie in our country. Thank you very much for listening. So guys, this is the most genius uh, speech this is the most uh, genius speech we are supposed to be hearing from our leader. But right now, it is too late. It is too late. I didn't bring this uh, vice president of Shibajo has spoken this before the election. Maybe it, must, it, it can be healed some out, you know? I believe. But now that you are making a speech, you know, anyway, like I said, this is uh, it's, uh, something that uh, we, we should keep in our mind that whatever you sow, you will, you will get. Whatever you sow, it is what you will achieve, you know. So as you lay your bed, you will lie on it. This is not going to be a Barnabas and Jesus and you could survive Jesus that he doesn't have any sin. Barnabas will go on the cross this time around and the youth are spoken. So thank you guys for watching. Um, we bring you updates as we promise you. We will be continue you know, to be sharing the light. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Uh, I love you all. Take care. Have a good weekend.